Welcome to another Roofer to Roofer. This is the, the show where we answer your questions about the roofing business. Um, I guess it's just you and I today, Scott. Is uh, Jonah going to make it? Uh, he texted me. He was he was uh, doing some family stuff. He might chime in here later, but okay. but probably okay. not today. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. Um, well, as always, we have our own list of questions that we're working through that we've been collecting, and so we we will go through our questions until we see um, any other questions pop up and. Uh, and if anyone suggests or suggests other questions, you can put those in the Q and A at the bottom, or um, raise your hand, and we will address those. Otherwise, we'll just be working through our questions that we already have. Let me pull those up. Here we go. All right, Scott. Can you install shingles over old shingles? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we've done it a few times. Um, I don't I don't like to. I don't prefer to. We've worked for a couple uh, people, and this has been years ago. We haven't done it for probably four or five years, but we work for some guys that own some like smaller rental places. And the only way to get the job was to do a second layer install. Um, they basically were supplying the material and said, Hey, I'm, I'm hiring somebody to nail them on back in that time. Uh, we were taking that kind of work uh, today. We're not, uh, we would just tell them, no, that's just not what we're going to do. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it can be done. I don't recommend it. I don't like it. I think it's an absolute nightmare for the next guy. Um, but yeah, it can be done. A lot of issues arise putting on shingles over existing shingles. Um, if the top layer leaks, it's already hard enough to find that leak, right? That's the biggest problem I have with it. It's already hard enough to find where the problem's at. If there's a second layer, so you, your leak came in here and it goes to the second layer clear over here, that's when you really start having issues with that second layer install. I, that's why I don't like it. Um, you know, I know other people have other other reasons with weight, different things, but but for me, it's just it's finding an issue if it ever arises. Yep, <clears throat> that makes sense. I'm trying to think. I was on a job site the other day and they decided to put shingles over a portion of the roof. I can't, I think they were putting a coating. I think they did a roof coating over shingles because it was a flat, it was a relatively flat, like a sunroom off the side of the house. And it was pretty flat and um, it hadn't been leaking but they're redoing the whole roof and homeowner. It, it was really old. It was a really old shingle roof, but it wasn't leaking. Um, and so they, I remember the pro or the, the project manager decided to just put the coating because they wanted to replace it with a coating was the, the goal. So they wanted to replace it with a coating, but they just decided to coat over the existing shingles. I don't know if that was the right decision hmm. or not. I, I tell you that honest to God, I, I, I don't, uh, I'd rather just be honest than, than uh, bullshit. Coatings is one place I am so unfamiliar with. I don't understand it. I don't know why people do it. It's so expensive for such a temporary idea. I, I've never I've never had any interest in it. I still don't have any interest in it. Uh, a silicone coating costs the same as a – damn near the same as a new rubber roof. I just tear it off the rubber on you know, so it, it or, or PPO or whatever. But yeah, I've, I've never understood that market years ago. I think coatings were significantly cheaper than membrane, but I knew the last time I priced it, material was significantly higher to where 
that the coating material was similar to EPDM material. So the only difference was labor. Well, that little bit of labor upcharge to me is a no brainer. You get a brand new full roof system instead of some bullshit rolled on over top of your old roof. That's just my opinion. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. It makes sense, especially if it's essentially the same price. Okay. Next question. Uh, so the question is, I'm a roofing contractor. I have a drone and I want to leverage the drone for my marketing. How can I use a drone to help my marketing efforts? Well, we're doing it right now. So um, that, that, that hits close to home. We, we were uh, shooting content uh, last week, um, actually from some advice from John Delorier about building a YouTube and having this, this content presence uh, across all social platforms. So we started shooting, you know, some in progress drone footage. We started taking some selfie style uh, cell phone type footage but the drone, uh, that footage is so good. It's so good for B-roll, whether that's a TV commercial, a Facebook commercial, whatever. You know, you can play that as the video while there's a voice talking. So it can be the B-roll in, in a video if you pay somebody to kind of build build a video with the content you create. But it could be, it could be a full Facebook commercial in itself. Um, maybe it's you talking about something during you know, the footage of the drone, or maybe it's just the drone doing a, you know, a full overview of the roof project uh, during install. And you just put po your post on that to social media. And I know for us, those, those kind of videos have got a lot of, uh, a lot of views, but even more so we send them to our customer that, that, you know, that was their house and they, they just think we're, we're the shit, you know, sharing that kind of drone footage with them. They, they think that's incredible. So, um, and all that does is build a potential referral. So I think those are, those are both ways you can use that to kind of better your marketing efforts and, and basically have no cost in it. Yeah. Is there any way to use it in your marketing copy and say like on the front end um, and advertise that you use drones for your inspections or use drones in your process or anything like that? So funny thing, I've actually heard that going both ways. Um, I have seen, I have literally read negative reviews, one star reviews. Now, I, now thank God I haven't got one yet because it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen, but I've seen one star reviews from customers bitching because the contractor was not willing to get on the roof to do an inspection. They wanted to use a drone or, and, or satellite imagery. And I can't, like I get where they're coming from as a customer because they just don't know. But I, I I think you could, you know, maybe publish the fact that, yeah, hey, we use drones a lot in our process. We'd love to share photos, drone or drone photos with you throughout the process and at the completion. But uh, you know, I, I would I would tread carefully about, you know, how far you take that. I, I still believe in the roofing sales uh, business. This is a personal touch. It requires, you know, that, that the customer believes you need to get on the roof, you need to shake their hand, you need to hand them a printed copy of an of a estimate, you know, those things where um, it. a lot of people believe that, and I was a believer that we were going more into a um, online sales type of process. I just don't think home services is there yet. I definitely don't think home services is there when the ticket item's so high. If it if it was three thousand dollars, maybe, but ten to twenty thousand dollars, I, I just don't think people are ready for that yet. I I agree. Um, this might be a hot take, but it's something I've been thinking a little bit about because. <clears throat> uh, I, I've been in a lot of conversations talking about how the industry is changing. People want to buy big purchases online and all these things. And it's like, 
that one of the examples, the two examples that get, they get tossed around are one Amazon mm-hmm. and two Tesla. Cause people are like, Oh, everybody wants Amazon. It's easy. You go order. And then it comes to your door. Everyone wants it quick and easy. But the problem with Amazon is like, people are not making $15,000 purchases on Amazon. I mean, you can, but it's very rare. It's super rare. It's like if you want any kind of volume, which you're, you need a certain amount of volume to be successful in roofing, you're not going to be able to sell like Amazon because that's not the way people want to buy that big of a purchase that's on their home. Um, and I, and I don't, I think it might be shifting a little bit, but I don't think it'll, it'll ever shift all the way. That's my, that's my hot take is that I don't think we're like moving towards this place where people want to buy a roof. Like they buy stuff on Amazon. I don't think we're shifting that way. I think maybe your people are a little bit more comfortable with the idea, but I, I think it's about as far as it's going to go. But the other thing that people talk about is like, Oh, well, people buy Tesla's online. They go and they, they order the Tesla brand. And I'm like, yeah, they order Tesla, but do they, they don't order Fords that way. They don't order Hondas that way. It's they're ordering Teslas that way because it's Tesla. The Tesla is yep. a unique brand. It, a it's unique very unique. Market. You're you're exact, but there's another step to that. It's also a product. It's not a service. That too. Yeah. You can get away with that possibly with a product with a really fantastic reputation for backing up their product. Yeah. A lot different than a local small business offering a service that can be completely human flawed in every step of the you know process than a product that leaves an assembly line hitting a multi-point checkpoint type, you know, yeah. finishing process before it's shipped out the door. Totally different. Don't get me wrong. I was on that page. I wanted to go, you know, online sales and be Amazon of roofing. I'm not saying the day may never come. I don't think I'll see it in my life. I really don't. I don't think home services. I don't think service-based businesses will go fully online in our lifetime, in my career time. I hope that's 20 years. I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I, I also think to speak more to your point with the product, it's like, Roofs are not one size fits all. Mm -mm. Like it's not only is it a service, but it's unique to every single customer. And and because of that, people want to feel like you recognize how unique they are when you make, when you're selling to them. So (laughs) yeah, that that's my hot take. I I have, I have a lot of love for the, the people out here that are trying to make that, you know, instant, instant quote, instant roof sale a reality. And I think that some people will buy that way. I just think it's a very small portion of the population and it's never going to grow beyond a certain point. So I agree. I will tell. No, I think you're right on. Yeah. Um, James, I saw your, your comments in here. He was talking about the, the coding only benefit I see with coding is on metal on industrial metal. Um, I guess like, uh, yeah. So that's like a coating all over top of like a, uh, commercial steel building. And, and I see that often and that makes sense to me. Um, yeah, there, there's that. I'm not saying there's not a time or place for it. It's just one of those things I've never, I've just never really got on board with. I just haven't, I, I would rather just replace the steel. I mean, and may, maybe that's a poor decision to just, you know, that's been, always been our mentality for some reason. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know if it's probably just lack of, honestly, it's probably lack of education. I've just probably never been trained on it well enough to understand the process and the benefits. Um, it's probably an anger, ignorance thing, yeah. you know? I mean, yeah, may, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not afraid to say that. It, I'm not, <laughs> I, you know, I, there's plenty in this world I haven't figured out yet. Uh, that's just one of the things I was never you know, brought around or taught. So we just never fooled with it. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so for everyone who's joined in, if you have a question, drop it down in the Q and a section. Um, there's a Q and a button and, um, and we will address that next. Otherwise we're just going to keep going through the questions that we already have lined up, but any questions that you have that you want us to, to, um, to discuss, please do put those, 
in the Q and A, uh, and we will, and we'll 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 tackle that next instead. All right. So from our list here. All right, so here here's a good one. I'm kind of surprised we this has been on the list for a while, so I'm surprised we haven't hit hit it before. But um, I, it's not the most relevant right now because we're you know middle of going into summer right now. But uh, the question is, how can I sell roofs during the off season? How what is the the best way during the off season when it's winter time? It's cold out. What is the is are there strategies that can be used to sell roofs even during those those months? So as much as I I am uh, not what's the word for non advocate as much as I am against metal roofing, that's what we turn to. So when when we know so about November, we change our marketing strategy. We're still honest with our homeowners when we go to bid the job and we let them know, hey, you know, we prefer installing shingles and we can do that. You know, if we get a 50 degree day this winter, because in Ohio here, we get plenty of warm days uh, where we can still do an, a, a shingle install. But but our marketing efforts are more geared toward metal. So what you end up getting is a lot more leads that are very directive and I want a metal roof. Fair enough. We're going to tell you pros and cons but if you decide to go with that that's on you we'll do a great install for you you know even though it's not the the product of choice in our company um but we always you know target that different market come november ish that way december january february hopefully we can you know be selling some metal jobs and you know we've swept freaking snow off the roof tore the shingles off put metal down 20 degree weather don't give a shit you know it, ju it just as long as we can get a clean deck and, and put metal down that's what we we do no matter what the weather yeah makes sense we're gonna need to we'll leave that on the list and we'll we'll answer it again when the off season comes around there you go um all right so we have we have a question here and if anyone else has questions please do put them in the q a um, but the question here we have is how do you combat the guys that are not licensed and give uh, cheap prices? So funny story today, I was on my QuickBooks and I was looking at fees that, that cost guys like us that are, that are playing by the rules and doing it right. And I was doing the math to really understand, you know, payroll taxes and, and, and licensing and, and and all these these things that you know insurance is one outlier i will say but but the other the rest of you know the rest of it so i did the math on the rest of it it was four percent of our of our business which is somewhat significant but with insurance it's probably going to be about six percent so you know it's not so significant though you can't still get competitive Six percent, you know, matters. But at the end of the day, um, if you can sell well and present well and offer some value to your customer, educate your homeowner. You know, be be a good salesperson. Then I believe that six percent, you should be able to prove six percent worth of value to your customer because that's not a lot. Um, now I also say that. I just I just did a little video for Proline today in Small Town River podcast about um, how to get lean and and really trimming the fat in your business and uh, I think that that's something right now that you know we have to be doing. It's it's a pretty tough market right now and I, I what I said in the video was basically you got two options: either be the fat cat in town, buy up all the marketing you can possibly possibly buy all the radios tvs otts uh billboards socials you know be the number one guy on all platforms or go non-existent and you get super super lean you know basically cut all overhead that you can possibly cut so um if you can go in i mean even if you've got salaries you know that that are in question that they're if they're not 
income producing salaries, you should be looking at that. Get your price down because these guys aren't going away. Like they're always, I was talking to somebody the other day, every spring there's 20 new yard signs that pop up in my neighborhood. They're not going away. They're always going to be there cutting your throat. You don't have to beat them. You just have to be good enough to outsell them. And I think that's where, you know, kind of the secret sauce is. Yep. That makes sense. I think that if anyone wants to dig deeper on this, they need to go watch that video um, when it gets posted. But I think that, that um, like understanding that there's two strategies here that win the, the strategy that you're bringing, bringing more value um, or the strategy, like super, super lean, like really heavy on marketing or super, super lean and, and like be inexpensive, be like come in cheaper and build a reputation around that. Like go one or the other. Um, I've got one competitor in, in my home market and, and I don't even, I hate to even consider him a competitor. But he is. He truly is. There's actually two. There's one in my Ohio market, one in my West Virginia market. The one's Amish, right? We deal with a lot of Amish in Ohio. And uh, fantastic guys. I've, I've spoke to them before. I know them. No personal beef. They kick my freaking ass on price all the time, you know, it, over, over the past in history. We decided we, we've seen their price enough. We know what they charge we started trying to figure out how can we get to that point? Where can we get to that price? We have figured out a way to get our margin tight enough where we're still feel, feel good about, you know, gross profit. We've just tightened our numbers up. We're within like 2% of this company every time now. And we win a lot of times because they're not local, even though they're Amish, they're from two hours away. They're not local. We still win a lot, even with, you know, being a little bit higher. So, um, but we've, we've kind of went that direction where we've got super lean and cut a lot of expenses to really, really be able to get our price point uh, super competitive. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. We, uh, thanks for that question. And if you guys have any more questions, hit us with those. Otherwise, we'll get back to our list. All right. How, uh, when planning a, a roofing job production or planning production uh, how do you account for weather changes and what kind of contingency plans do you put in place to handle weather changes so i don't remember who i was talking to about this if it was you or yeah you and i were talking about this right about yeah. how we run basically a floating schedule yeah yeah so basically <laughs> the contingency is we'll either be there tomorrow or it's raining like that's, that's kind of how it works. So we don't, we put in all of our messaging leading up to the project. I mean, it's, it's, it's hammered on that this job is weather dependent. You know, there is no set schedule. There is no exact time frame. But what we do is we kind of just keep our customers in line using ProLine and using automated messages. When their materials are ordered, they get a message. When their materials are going to be delivered, they get a message. 24 hours before we start the job, they get a phone call. Um, and we let them know we're going to be there tomorrow, weather dependent. But all the way up through, we're letting them know we'll be in touch within, you know, 24 hours before your project. So that way they're not surprised. They know it's coming. You know, we, we've set the stage and kind of, you know, set the tone, I guess, uh, of what to expect. And then we give them a 24 hour heads up that we'll be there tomorrow as long as the weather works for us. That's it. Um, the way our schedule works is there is no schedule. 
It's first come, first serve. So whoever's at the top of the list, they're tomorrow. If it rains, they're the next day. And it just it just funnels down from there. And we only we never get pushback from people about us, you know, taking too long to get to their job or putting them off for the next guy. You know, we we never get that kind of pushback ever. So um it's what works for us. I, I don't think it's perfect, but if we had 15, 20 sales guys, it might be, we might have to figure something else out, but for having four sales guys, you know, it, it's a, it works for us. Yeah. That makes sense. But keep it, just keep it simple. Mm-hmm. Keep it simple. Yeah. We're, we're going to be doing a, an overhaul of our calendar functionality here. Um, after we got to, got to finish up this UI, um, overhaul, and then we're going to jump into counter overhaul. And it's one thing I want to try to take into account is, I mean, obviously the calendars need to work for people that want to schedule back to back. Got a little intermission here. A little break. Everything good? Yeah, I need a drink. <laughs> there you go, one for me too. Um, but the, yeah, you can you can. Um, I I'm 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 I blanked out. I can't remember what we're talking about. You're you're making your production calendar. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I was listening to you as I walked away. You, oh, could, you can hear it. You can hear it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The the calendar. <laughs> we wanted to work for people that are that are super regimented with the dates. And we're going to work on having um, some like shuffle shuffle tools and stuff, shift events as needed, stuff like that. But um, we also are, I, I want to, I want to see if there's a way to, to kind of set it up to work for that sched, that type of schedule as well. That kind of looser while still like allowing for some automation and stuff like that. Um, I think doing that, I think the calendar feature is great if you have a production manager. So if you have someone that's actually, say they got three to a million sales guys, if there's somebody that's managing the calendar, that's their job is managing that production schedule. Then I think that uh, a company would kill for that. I know I would. Where we are continuing to do cradle to grave with our sales guys for us, it just it doesn't make sense because the sales guy, he's also running the production, so he knows who's next and who's coming up, and what he told so-and-so, well, you know, so it just makes sense for them. And, and they're also in touch with the crew, so. But we're wanting to go to production manager. Yeah, I mean, it could come sooner than later, but, but next year at the latest, and we would absolutely want to be running a calendar because that production guy, that's what he's going to be doing. That's going to be his Bible is that calendar. Yeah. To manage everything. That makes sense. Yep. So it's like different team setups um, work better with different, different calendar approaches. Yep. All right. Uh, we've got a question here. What do you think you uh, net profit should be? And for a roofing business. They say gross profit should be, be what 30 to 35 percent somewhere in there but uh and to know your net i mean you really have to understand your overhead and i think 95 percent of contractors have no clue what their overhead is I, i mean i struggle with mine you know it's it's really really hard to keep track of to keep figured out um you got to keep personal items out of the business to truly understand it. You know, there's a lot of things. So net profits, an interesting question, but, but my goal is when the year ends, I want to be somewhere around 12 to 15%. That's my goal. I always want to, and I'm usually in that ballpark, 12 to 15%. Um, this year I'd be tickled to do right at 10%. Uh, that because we, I I've, I've cut, you know, pricing in places, I'm okay with taking a price cut myself. Um, I'll, t- I'll take I'll take five percent off off of my year end, um, as long as we can kind of maintain the volumes, maintain the 
market share that we have and, and kind of keep the ball rolling. I don't want to slow. I don't want to give up market share just to maintain profit margin. I'd rather take a decrease in margin and maintain my market share. I don't know that that's right. It's just the way I feel about it. Yeah, it's an interesting perspective. I feel like not everyone feels that way. Um, no. For sure. It's like, oh, the margin is the most important thing. But the thing is, getting your margin back is you just start changing the numbers on the next quotes. But I do like how your outlook on it because it's really hard to get market share back. So that's outside of your, your control to a certain extent. And it so, is. Like once you okay, lose, here's you let you give the opportunity for somebody to step in. So, you know, Cartersburg, Marietta, we're we're killing it. You know, we're doing really well. If I dropped all advertising efforts, I maintained a 35 to 40 percent margin. You know, I, I I kept all these high, high standards of business of uh you know best ever economy standards. Okay, well I'm I'm going to give an, if I back all, you know, keep all that and I don't uh, tighten things up a little bit, I give somebody an opportunity to move right in and, and take a big piece of my market. And then next year when, when chick gets good again, they, they've got a huge customer base that I used to have. Yep. Yep. I'd rather have 10% of something than 20% of nothing. So I know that saying is bullshit and a lot of people don't like it, but I'll, I'll keep my 10% of, of something. Yeah. That makes sense. Makes sense. Um, got another question here. A lot of great questions from, uh, it just says iPhone. So I'm not sure who it is, but <laughs> um, the good questions here. The next question is what do you think about roofing are combining roofing and solar. Do you think roofing companies should sell solar or no? Easy. Uh, Izzy. I like Thanks, it. Izzy. Um, so I actually was just at this uh, GAF conference and I really think they figured out how to sell solar um, because I don't believe a roofing company I think it'd be really tough for a roofing company to employ electricians and make that balance work unless you're in maybe like California or some really, really, um, I'm just going to say liberal areas that have those it, just, it, and it's not that, that that's a bad thing. I'm saying liberal areas as in there's a lot of incentive to go solar, right? Government is pushing you to go solar like California. There's tons of incentive. Um, and I know even big cities in Ohio, like Columbus, you know, in Columbus, there's incentive, city tax dollars incentive, I believe, to go, you know, more solar. So um, the more liberal the area is, the more opportunity there is for, you know, a solar cell, I believe. But but regardless, GAF started this program where um, they have, they employ all of the electricians in your market to where you just sell the solar. You, you have to go through schooling and get an education on how to install their solar. But all you do is install the panel work. The electrician from GAF then comes in and does all the wiring work, all the electrical work. That's the only place I've heard of that. And, and that could happen. Maybe, maybe Tesla or someone else is offering that, but I think that has been the best solution I've seen because I think, think us as roofers don't we don't mix well with electricians i don't feel like um it's totally different game it's a it's a totally different mindset and an employee base i just don't think it's the right call yeah or find a fantastic subcontractor that that'd be the only other way you know a really good subcontractor you could depend on yeah. My um one of my cousins sells solar in Wyoming. Uh he's crushing it. He all his company only does solar. They don't do anything else. 
Um, and so he's told me how they partner with roofing companies and they'll, uh, send leads to roofing companies when they're, when the roof needs to get replaced before the solar can go on. Um, and then he has same relationship back with them. So they'll some, they'll sometimes pitch solar, um, or they'll, they'll kind of feel out solar, have roofing jobs where they just replace the roof and the homeowner's interested in solar and they send those leads to him. And so I think that's another kind of, and I guess that's could is somewhat of a subcontractor. It could be a subcontractor relationship, but it also could just be like a solid referral. Um, and, it's basically yeah. a channel partner at that point. Yeah. Yeah. So I think fostering those relationships may be the overall better approach. Then you're not even having to worry about managing it or paying any, you just let the solar company do their stuff. You do the roofing stuff, but then you're getting more jobs from them and they're getting more jobs from you both benefit um but there's no you don't gotta complicate anything so yeah i like it <laughs> all right all right so if you guys got any any other questions please do put those in the q a um and we, we will address those uh otherwise we're gonna get back to our list here All right. Um, so this question is from someone new, someone new just coming into the roofing business. And uh, he's a little nervous um, going up on roofs to inspect jobs uh, solo. And he's just wondering what kind of safety measures should he be looking at when he's going up on roofs by himself to check them out. Maybe sometimes, you know, the homeowner's not even there. He's worried falling off the roof and then no one knows and unconscious <laughs> oh or something. Dude, I got a story for you. <laughs> so it's been like four years ago now. I never had a fear of shit. Like I, and I never was scared of heights at all. And then my, my longest employee that I've had a uh, set of trusses fell on him while we were building my personal garage and it almost killed him, broke his back in like eight places. I mean, all, all but killed the freaking guy. And uh, I'm a little scared of heights now, but to the big story, I couldn't give a shit. Like I could care less. It didn't matter. So I'm up uh, out in the middle of nowhere. And I mean, I'm like 40 minutes from a fast food joint, middle of nowhere, right? I'm up on it. I go look at this roof. The people live in California. It's their uh, summer house in Ohio, in the mountains. Old family home that they just kept and they come visit in the summer. So I go measure this thing. Nobody's there. You can't see shit around. It's like 400 acre farm. It's beautiful. The wind's ripping. And my goddamn ladder blows off this two story house while I'm up on it. Oh. <laughs> I pull my phone out. There is no cell phone signal, you know. Oh, so no. My point is, step one, strap your freaking ladder off. Don't ever not strap your ladder. I never, I literally carry a bunch of cords on all of my ladders because it's like, I had to jump off a two-story house. You know what I mean? Like, no joke. And I had, I had no option. You just um, have to, just, did you just roll it out? I took off running from the ridge all the way to the eave and then jump out to where like I, I could kind of like roll it out. It like, it jacked me up for sure. Um, I was okay, but uh, I mean, I had no other option. I sat there for like 10 minutes waiting to see if I could get signal. No signal, you know? Uh -huh. um, so always strap your ladder off. The other thing too is if a roof, you know, say the sheeting's in just hot awful shape, th there's two things, sheeting and then granule. Uh, so if the sheeting is real wavy, then, you know, there's a chance that it could be super soft and you might just want to stay off of it. You know, pull your measurements through a, through a, uh, aerial measurement technology software of some kind. Um, and then granules, I've been on some roofs that were like six on 12 and I, I mean, I used to shingle eight, nine on 12s and walk them, never tie off or anything. I've been on some five and six pitch roofs that the granule loss was so bad 
that you'd step on it was like ice you just you'd slide just, just slide down the roof so you know always always kind of check that out you know if, put your foot up there kind of scrape around see if you're you're going to stick to it or or if you're just going to start sliding off because i have been on them where i would have typically just jumped off the ladder and took off running across the roof that's a good thing i didn't right i ended up on my ass So yeah, tie off the ladder. It's number one. Tie off ladder. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, yeah, I guess there's you can't really. There's not much else you can do if you're, if you're just doing an inspection. It's not like you can tie off or anything. So, just gotta be, just just don't be a don't be a don't be dumb. It's funny. It almost seems like that's a big reason OSHA doesn't mess with residential roofers that much. It's a really gray area because how can you honestly get on and do an inspection on a residential roof and actually tie off without damaging that roof? Right. I'd love to know how because I don't know how. Not, not, I know how it's not reasonable. Um, I would like to know a reasonable way to do it. So how do you damage, you know, even roofers getting up on that roof? I know there's a rule with OSHA first man up or first man on or something like that. So they have some play there during installation, but during inspections, I don't know how they regulate that. Yeah. All right, I uh, got another question here from Izzy. Uh, can you recommend a good company for OTT advertising? It's on you. <laughs> so OTT advertising um, is, it's like the advertising that comes through and you're watching like the free version of Netflix. I don't know, maybe, ne I don't know if Netflix has ads now, but like Hulu, like Hulu um, ads is like an OTT example of OTT. Um, I, this is something I have almost no experience with, even though I'm from a marketing background. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, if, if that's, if that's not what you mean by OTT, if there's something else that you mean by OTT advertising, that's, that's what I'm familiar with as far as OTT advertising goes. Um, yeah, I don't have off the top of my head. I don't, I don't know of any providers. I, I don't know if there's even places you can, I, I, I feel like there's probably places you can go and buy it across multiple channels, but you're probably going to have to, you're probably going to pay more for that. Um, but you can always just go directly to something like Hulu and just use their targeting and run a campaign with their advertising platform. Um, same with any other platform that you, you would like to use. I think it, it may just depend. It may depend on some factors, but um, I mean, yeah, I would, that's the way I would approach it. If I was going to try to run an OTT campaign is I would just go directly to a few um, and like who is off the top of my head. I have no idea if that's like a great um, channel or not, but. Uh, hopefully that helps. All right. Okay. So um, just uh, for anyone else joining us, we uh, we're just going through a list of questions, but if you guys have any questions that you want us to answer, please put those in the Q and a um, there's a, a Q and a button and just type those questions in and we'll, we're happy to, to address those instead. But, um, until we see anything new pop up, we're going to go back to our list of questions that we've been collecting. All right. Um, do you have any, this is, here's the question. So do you have any tricks or tips um, when it comes to just staying up to date with local uh, building codes and regulations that would be relevant for roofing? No. <laughs> that was the question. <laughs> what, what answer did you expect? Let me ask you that. That's the <laughs> next question. 
<laughs> no, no, that's bullshit. We, um, no, we don't do anything special. You know, we know what we know what the codes are. We know what they were when we took all the tests. I mean, uh, did it change that much? Like, is it not that I know of? I mean, here's the thing. So, the biggest thing about building code that that I think is too often forgot. Almost so building code is written and then it is how it's interpreted by the inspector. So one inspector could pass you, the next can fail you. So that's that's rule one. Rule two is they almost always divert back to manufacturer installation recommendations. So let's say you're using GAF, right? Whatever GAF requires. <clears throat> To meet their spec, that almost always supersedes any local building code. So whatever the manufacturer requires, that's usually more prevalent and probably a, a harder thing to achieve than local building code. Local building code is minimum. Manufacturer recommendation, I think, is what should be the standard. Yeah, that makes sense. That's yeah. easy. Usually it's on the package or in the directions, right? Like that's just do what they tell you to do. That's because that's the way it's supposed to be done. Yeah. So if you're focused on, on meeting the specs for the warranty to be valid, then you're going to be good in most yeah. locales. Probably significantly more than good. Yeah. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Do you guys have to have um, inspectors come out to every roof to inspect the roof after you're done? Since probably 2017, I haven't seen the inspector get out of their vehicle. <laughs> they just come and look from their car. They don't give a shit, man. <laughs> I, I, and I get in a fight with that entire department. The, the one in Marietta, I get in a fight with them guys like once a month. <laughs> the lady in the office calls and bitches and raises hell with me because I don't get a part way inspection. And I tell her every time we do the job in one day. Your guys never get out of the vehicle. You just want my money. Quit bothering me. Oh, you have to pay every time the inspector comes out. <laughs> every time. Yeah, so every she, time. She's like, you got to do a halfway halfway done inspection. No, <laughs> like no, you only pay the one time. No, that would make more sense, though. But you only have to pay for the one time. I think she just thinks we'll fail it. And it's like, lady, we literally, like, I just looked at it. I literally just looked at a project while we were talking on company cam has like 274 photos we document everything you know if a, a freaking re-roof and it's just a re -roof. if a re-roof project has nearly 300 photos i promise you we did everything we were supposed to and we have proof of it you know yeah yeah but anyway yeah they're too slow to get there twice in one day why would i why would i even waste my time yeah Maybe someday the uh, the inspect the these inspection agencies will just accept a uh, company camp project and they'll just do it, do it from that. The inspectors do, the lady in the office not so much. <laughs> so the, the inspectors are fine with the photos. Yeah, they don't give a shit. They they'll let me text it to them. They don't even they don't even want to come see it like in person. Just, yeah. yeah, just send it to me a text. Sounds good. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. All right. What kind of, um, how do you manage customer expectations during roof production? Is there anything you do specifically to set expectations at a reasonable level for, for how that job proceeds? Yeah, that's all. That all starts at the quote. The, you know, that entire process that, that you're looking for there starts at the initial presentation. Um, you never want to mislead the customer or let them think at any time that this is going to be a clean or neat and tidy or noise-free environment. This is going to be loud, messy, and, a, 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 you know, organized chaos is what it's going to be. But understand, when we leave, it'll be perfect. 
you know, so, so you have to really all the way up to the, the day of install, every communication, we, we do a couple things during communication in almost every communication we express what goes on during the roof install. We express how much we want to earn a five-star review and we remind them to never hesitate to reach us if there's an issue along the way. So like, there's things, you know, we want our customers to be really confident and, and talk to us about and portraying throughout this project. No, those are the things that matter most, I think, to getting, having a satisfied customer when the project's done. That makes sense. Makes sense. Let me see. Any new new questions? No questions. Okay. Um, I think we got time. We got time for at least one more question. So, if you guys in the the audience have any more more questions for us, please do put that in the Q and A, and we'll address that. But we'll do one more from our list here, um, while we see if another one comes through. Um, all right. So this question is, is there a way to use before and after photos in roofing marketing? Oh yeah. I mean, that, that's like the cream of the crop in Facebook organic posts, as far as I'm concerned. Um, there, there's other than, than like actual real quality video content. I don't think there's a better chance of getting engagement on social media. What do you think? I mean, do you feel the same? Yeah, no, I think before and afters are great. I think where I see before and afters go wrong is when people will just take the before photo and uh, post it as a separate photo from the after photo. And they'll post this either, whichever way you post it doesn't matter. But if you post it, to, when you post it as two different images on any social platform, um, people are not going to take the time to read the description and see and understand that that's a before and after. So uh, there's a number of people that will look at that other photo and this is going to happen on every platform, like on, on Facebook, they're, they're just going to pull it up on Instagram. It actually, cause Instagram will show you the first image in a, in a slideshow. And then if you don't scroll, it'll re-show you the post, but it'll be on the second image automatically. So people are going to see that and they're just going to assume that's what your roofs look like when they're done. Like a number, it may not be all, it may not even be, you know, a substantial number, but somebody's going to see that post and think that's the way you do roofs. Uh, because they don't, they don't know. Um, right. And so, the, 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 if you're, when you're posting before and afters, it's important to edit them together and you can do this with Canva. There's lots of you know, free, easy tools to do this, but you want to somehow put it together and some sort of collage or with a, like an angled line or a, you know, top and bottom before and after label it before and after on the image. Um, and then also ideally you want to take the images from the exact same angle each time. That's going to make it super clear. Um, and if you do everything else, but then it's a little bit of a different angle, it's not the end of the world, but it, it's going to take a little bit, a little bit more thought to understand what's going on. But if you do a before and after on one image uh, with the exact same angle, that's going to be very impactful. That's, that's been my perspective on which I, I've run before and after campaigns um, or like created that content for, for John and other clients when I was in marketing before. Yeah, I agree. So, um, I think my favorite was like the diagonal, you know, the diagonal line. And then the... Do you remember, did Facebook, they allowed you to build that collage type format inside of Facebook. See, this is, this is where now I'm outdated because I haven't done marketing and I mean, not, not like I did for, for probably three, four years now. So that may be the case. I'm not aware of it, but you're probably right. I, it would make sense for them to have that where you can just build it inside of Facebook. Yeah, I think you could do, and you could even like title them before and after. Like they had these features to where when you were like building a post, you could kind of mess with it and, and, and edit that photo to look like that. 
Yeah. I don't know if it's still an option because now I'm outdated because I ain't been on it for two years. <laughs> uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So that, that makes it even easier. It's like, mm-hmm. just, don't, just don't upload two photos. Just use the, the little collage builder tool in your platform of choice. I don't know if that's on like Instagram or not. Maybe it is. No idea. Yeah, I, I, th- I feel like I've seen it before on um, on Facebook for sure. I've never been on Instagram, so that that's a whole nother beast to me. Man, never, not one you're not, time. You're uh, you're missing out on all the, all the absolute shallowness of it. That is, <laughs> yeah. you're really missing out. <laughs> Boobs everywhere. Oh huh? uh, yeah, that's that's pretty <laughs> much it. That's the entire platform. But yeah, that's hilarious. I, uh, fun fact: I used to be an Instagram influencer in, huh. in, col- in college. Yeah, I like. I used to, cause I, before I did, before I got into contractor marketing, cause I wanted to, I wanted to make something of my life. I, um, I was into photography and then I would, I would do, I'd post it on Instagram and then I started transitioning to like photos of photos of me. And like, I, I got, I got some followers. I got, I got up to, um, I can't remember if I ever broke 30,000, but I, I think I got up to like 28, 29,000 followers. Dang it was it. all around like my photography and stuff. It just, it, it, it was not fun. Like it, you hate your life. Like you, you're living your life for other people. And also yeah. 30,000, 30,000 followers is nothing. Like you're, you're not, you're not like making money or anything at that, at that level. You got to get right. at least a hundred thousand before it even matters. But it was, it was an interesting experience. Huh? Yeah. I think I got like 200 friends on Facebook that I don't get on. <laughs> <laughs> that's me now i think i have like 13 followers and yeah, yeah right yeah. i try to keep a low profile until they start doing these podcasts i guess yeah yeah no it's but this is this is it's different it's different um these this is my community this is the people i want to yeah. talk to yeah right. so that definitely makes it makes it okay by me oh yeah there's like it's such it's so different um building a community and interacting with a community uh, as opposed to just trying to be an influencer. I always, uh, um, yeah, I think, I think there's a, there's a big difference with that. It's like, it's outward focused, not inward focused. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, all right. Um, well, we will wrap this up for today. It's been another, another fun roofer to roofer. So, Thanks for tuning in, Scott. I can't tell if that's the exact same place you were before or if it's different. <laughs> but it, it looks is. similar. It is the same place? I think my picnic table is in the same spot even. Yeah. Oh, this is at your house? No, no. I'm I'm at uh campground up, up in like uh Canton, Ohio. Oh, okay, cool. Nice. Yeah. We we just come up uh, a couple hours ago. So Oh nice. You just go back to the same spot? uh it's a permanent site so we'll leave our camper here all year except when we like go somewhere in particular so yeah yeah it's great cool i like it um izzy says uh thank you and good night so same to you izzy all right everyone uh have a good night we'll talk to you later we'll see you next week see ya